Good morning. Nice to see everyone. My name is Josh Mitz. I'm a professor here at Columbia Law School. I actually did my PhD in finance at the business school, so this place feels like home. It's nice to see all of you. Uh, I'm going to talk in this project about what I call short and distort. Uh, I should say at the outset that this is a really hot area right now in a lot of different ways. Um, it's hot, uh, particularly on the litigation front. Um, as you see in my conflict of interest disclosure, I'm not going to discuss any cases in the academic project. Uh, academic project does not uh, relate to any of the cases in which I'm involved. But if you're curious at where this is going um, and what's happening in the courts right now, I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A or after, um, because it's a really active area. Some of you in journalism might be aware uh, of the role that short sellers are playing in ongoing shareholder litigation. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that but uh, during the presentation, but I'd be happy to, to continue that uh, after. All right. So this project is going to talk about market manipulation. Now, you know, one of my colleagues at the law school, Merritt Fox, is a, a great titan of securities law, and has said, you know, we have these rules and regulations governing our securities markets, not only to keep companies from lying to their investors, but also to keep folks from manipulating our financial markets. In fact, market manipulation may be larger or at least as large as insider trading, which is a classic area of regulatory focus, um, but it's gotten a lot less attention. It's gotten a lot less attention by, uh, by regulators, by enforcement authorities, by policymakers, um, even by the press. Right? It's always, there's always a sizzling story around a corporate insider who uh, trades on material non-public information, but uh, market manipulation is sometimes uh, relegated to a secondary role, and and then you know there's no good reason for it because you know at a theoretical level market manipulation has many of the exact same effects as informed trading on stock prices, um, reduces share price accuracy, decreases liquidity, that may harm real investment. Um, so you know it's worth thinking about, especially because we live in an era today uh, where we have new forms of market manipulation like a tweet by our dear president. Um, December 22nd, 2016, I, I probably don't need to tell anyone in this room this, uh, you know, here's the, 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 the famous Lockheed Martin tweet that it has so many tremendous cost and cost overruns and the shares took a tumble right after the tweet. This seems to happen on a regular basis. Uh, and, you know, I'm gonna pause and say that you get, if you ever get a lawyer and an economist to talk about market manipulation, um, and you know I am both, so I kind of have this conversation with myself. Um, it goes you something like this, you know. Well, look at this behavior. This is concerning, right? This is potentially manipulative, the lawyer says, and the economist will always reply, "Yes, but there is a legitimate justification for this trading." Let me give you a model that shows that X phenomenon, like market reacting to a Trump tweet, um, is non-manipulative. It's just what we expect in financial markets. Uh, and then the lawyer will say, ah, the economist never wants to concede that there's market manipulation. And what I'm going to do in this project is, you know, try to sidestep the debate of whether something can be non-manipulative, because you can probably always find some non-manipulative justification for uh, the phenomenon that we see in the financial markets. But I'm going to ask like a burden of proof question, right? Which is, do we think that this behavior is likely to be manipulative? Do we think that we're seeing a pattern that should concern policymakers, right? And that question is a little bit different because we're going to have to ask ourselves, you know, is there a story where this seems to be manipulative, and how much do we believe that story? Uh, and you know, keeping in mind that there's always likely to be a non-manipulative justification, but it may not be very convincing sometimes. So let's the, what's the setting of this project? So it is probably the nemesis, the arch nemesis of the, uh, uh, of the traditional media is Seeking Alpha. And I only say that because it seems like websites like Seeking Alpha are taking over more and more of journalism. Um, probably everyone in this room knows what Seeking Alpha is. When I give this talk and present to law faculty, they are shocked that there exists a website that can move stock prices that is not the Wall Street Journal. 
um, you'd be surprised. They <laughs> say to me, how could that be? Uh, or the New York Times. Uh, and you know, in fact, when you read case law, as I do, I teach securities here uh, at the law school, and we read these like, you know, opinions from the federal courts from the 1990s, and you see sentences like, there's no way an in reasonable investor would listen to anything other than the most authentic of sources. Uh, the, the best in journalism you know, are, are established, reputable news outlets. They're the ones who move stock prices. Um, yeah, yeah. Not in 2019, right? So this is Seeking Alpha. Seeking Alpha, uh, as many of you know, has uh, styled itself as the place for financial commentary uh, and financial news. One of the things that, less, I think, that gets less attention about Seeking Alpha is that Seeking Alpha embraces pseudonymity. I'm going to use that word rather than anonymity because pseudonymity is a unique thing, different from anonymity. It is the use of identities that are anonymous but that preserve their like, identity. Right. So you create an account on Seeking Alpha uh, you could call yourself, you know, Darth Vader, right? And having called yourself Darth Vader, it turns out that Harry, despite his best efforts, will not be able to call himself Darth Vader, right? So the owner of Darth Vader is in fact Darth, right? Like that is that is, you know, you you own that identity. Um, and Seeking Alpha justifies its embrace of pseudonymity by making an interesting claim that we'll come back to when we think about the equilibrium here and why this is emerging, uh, which is that you know, due to regulations at the workplace or other factors, some contributors are not able to reveal their real names. In addition, many well-known veteran stock market bloggers, some of the finest, the very best people, in fact, write under a pseudonym. All right, so this is their, their justification. Um, since this isn't a law class, I won't spend much time on this, but anonymity gets constitutional protection, which is kind of an interesting wrinkle on this story. So if you want to try and find uh, Darth Vader, good luck. The courts are not going to turn over Darth's identity, Darth's real identity to you for constitutional reasons. Problem is right, that accountability in markets turns on reputation. This is like Econ 101, right? We've got like decades of papers, including the one uh, that I talk about in this project, where we've got a model, we've got models after models that 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 you know basically stand for the proposition that market participants will listen to those who have established credibility in a in a market, and if you haven't established credibility, you're not going to be taken seriously. So. The accountability mechanism that's inherent to reputation, like turns on accountability in inherently, right? That is to say, if your reputation is manipulable, then it's going to be difficult to hold you accountable for what you're saying, right? And uh, uh, another way to say that is that pseudonymity would seem, at least at first glance, to undermine reputational sanctions. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to show in this project is that pseudonymous, pseudonymous authors, I had to look that one up on MW.com, pseudonymous authors will manipulate and then switch identities. And that's exactly what we would expect, right, from pseudonymity, <laughs> that you are able to exploit the fake identity you've created and Darth Vader becomes Darth Maul. And someone told me I have that out of order. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen the movie. Uh, Sky Tides. Here's one. All right. Sky Tides is at skytides.com. If he's still there, you can go look right now. And Sky Tides, uh, no one really knows who Sky Tides is. Actually, some short sellers tell me they do know who Sky Tides is, but they won't tell me after I wrote this paper. Sky Tides uh, attacked a publicly traded company on November 29th, 2016, by the name of Insulate. Insulate is a manufacturer of insulin delivery pods. They're actually doing quite well today. On November 29th, Sky Tides posted an article uh, titled, Insulate Investors Are Being Kept in the Dark. The CEO is alleged to encourage questionable sales techniques, and there's significant downside that remains. Now, if you look at the article, the claims in the article are kind of you know, similar in style. I'm going to say more about what I mean by style. You know, claims are like evidence, there's evidence of yet another whistleblower payoff. Or the CEO allegedly directed employees to bribe physician, physicians. 
or multiple sell side analysts have claimed that the CEO deceived investors by not fully disclosing prior misconduct. What's unique about all these statements? What's the common denominator? None of them are factual claims. None of them are factual claims, except for the fact that you know, someone made the allegation. None of them are actually factual claims. So the, the fact there's evidence of a whistleblower payoff doesn't mean there actually was a whistleblower payoff, just something that suggests there was, right? Uh, the CEO is not, Sky Ties is not claiming that the CEO actually directed employees to bribe physicians, but rather that there's an allegation that the CEO directed employees to bribe. That's not the same thing legally. Very different, right? The defamation folks in the room. Uh, multiple sell side analysts, all right, that's a fact, but they could be totally wrong. And the article's making no claim about whether they are telling the truth. So this article has pretty much zero affirmative factual claims in it. That's really important. If you want to maintain a fraud or a defamation claim against sky tides, you are wasting your time. Courts will kick this out right out the front door. What happened to Insulet's stock price? Well, two things we noticed. One, it fell, the article came out on the 29th. It fell from the 29th to the, I think the 1st of December. I think this was before a weekend or maybe, yeah, anyway, uh, right after the next trading day. Uh, it also fell before the article, all right? And this is a key part of the story. We're gonna see this over and over again. It fell before the article. Not surprising to those who research news and finance because we know that pretty much every major news event is preceded by leakage of some kind. My colleagues at the law school were fascinated by this yesterday when I presented this paper. They said, how can it be? And I said, well, my friends, there are in fact theories in financial economics that suggest that if you have information, you will trade on it. Yeah, and that's what happens. <laughs> The law faculty, this is kind of, you know, supposed to be illegal. Um, actually, it's not illegal, right? Because this is not inside information obtained from the firm. So this trading is not illegal. In fact, I'm going to document this trading for you and show you in a second. It's happening, it's real, and it's moving the price. Um, and so the price is falling because of some informed trading before. Uh, and that's, that's uh, pretty much what every short seller will tell you. We short, and then we tell you what we've shorted. Right? Clearly, they want to make money, and their shorting activity is moving the price. So it definitely fell. What's the, I guess, third fact that we should take away from this? Well, there were a lot of allegations and opinions in this piece, but stock market didn't really think much of it after a few days. There was a price reversal. Right? So you know, Sky Tides did a pretty good job inducing a V, inducing a price reversal. And I'm talking to the short sellers. They all tell me, yes, of course we sell, close out our position here because we don't really know what the market's going to think, all right? And we might, in fact, get caught in the wrong place. Well, you know, what I'm going to show you is that they do more than that. They close out their position and they also switch positions, right? And they like to ride the expected V right all the way back up. Is it manipulation legally? Well, that's an interesting question. Is it a problem from a policy standpoint? Is it manipulative? Quite possibly, quite possibly. If we look at the options data for sky tides, we see that just as you might expect, this is measuring here open interest for nearly at the money put options. Happy to, in the Q&A, talk about what all this, how all this is defined. But uh, what we see is that you know, pretty much right before the article is posted, there's a spike, not a mega spike here in volume, um, a number of contracts, but there's a spike in put options relative to calls uh, that immediately declines right after the article is posted. So here's your informed trading, right? Here's your informed trading in this broad sense of I know that there's some information coming out to the market and I'm going to trade on it. Here it is in this example. And that's probably why the price falls before the article is posted. The next fact I'm going to bring to the table is to answer the question that a lot of economists ask, which is why, when equilibrium, would a market ever listen to sky tides? Like, who listens to anonymous, crazy voices on the internet? Like a lot of my colleagues have said, who tweets? So, well, believe it or not, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. Uh, uh, just, I'm just teasing. So, law school isn't that antiquated. But you know, when you look here. All right, this is Sky Tides history, okay? So Sky Tides proudly has this on their website. If it's still online, skytides.com, you can go see it. 
So for the first you know, few times that SkyTides attacked these companies, first he started with some penny stocks, then he tried some bigger fish, and he kind of like claims to have knocked their value down pretty far. Um, who knows what the causality here is if he just, who knows, right? But this is the, this is the low since the report was released, who knows? But let's, let's say that in some of these cases, SkyTides probably called it or SkyTides was well-timed. Um, then he came, then came around insulate. Now here's the question, right, theoretically, for the economists in the room. Um, if you've built up a good reputation, if you're sky tides, like should the market listen to you, right? And I think the answer is probably yes, although I got an interesting question yesterday, like, you know, do you have to keep like working harder? You know, maybe you need to do like seven articles. So maybe in the Q&A you'll, you'll have some ideas for me on that because I'm not sure that every aspect of this equilibrium has been fully fleshed out. So this is a great chance to think about that together. Uh, what do I do in the project in the sort of more systematic empirical study? So I collect all the short ideas, articles on Seeking Alpha, um, then remove some articles about like, companies like Tesla, which have a new article every day on Seeking Alpha. It just makes this useless. Um, I'm going to limit to mid caps and above. And the reason for that is that it's really hard to get any kind of, of uh, price efficiency, I think, for the small caps. When I looked at the small caps, I found that their pricing was just really all over the map. It would fall, price would often fall, and nothing would happen. Um, generally speaking, when there were reversals for small caps, they would happen like months later. Think about the typical small cap, uh, it's under a, a cloud of uncertainty. And so unlike the mid caps, you're not going to see arbitrage traders pile back in in the case of questionable news like insulin. Now that raises the question, like does this matter? I mean, in a sense, maybe the injury to the small caps is where it's really at. And we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, in effect, you might be much more concerned about long-term mispricing for small caps. Economists or financial economists in the room, this brings up a joint hypothesis problem. How would we possibly measure that if we're not sure about market efficiency for those folks? But open to your ideas. Um, what are some examples of some pseudonymous authors? So we got Midnight Trader, Bargain Bin, um, Efficient Alpha, and my favorite of all, Bumblebee Goombie Flower. They only posted one time, probably didn't think it was the best name. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to propensity score match pseudonymous and non-pseudonymous authors here on a bunch of covariates to try and make the comparison as uh, meaningful as possible. I'm not going to claim that this is uh, like perfect causality. I'm not even going to claim make a causal hypothesis here to disarm the uh, you know economist. No, I'm just kidding. Comes, but you know I'm not going. There's no causal claim, right? The idea here is just to try and make these groups as similar as possible, and I'm just going to describe the phenomenon. And um, you know, we can certainly ask whether it might be driven by something else. Uh, uh, I, we don't see much else happening at this time, and hopefully the matching adjusts for at least a lot of, of possible confounds. So what's the overall a on average finding? We see that the cumulative abnormal returns to publication of the, publication of the article look a lot like sky tides mixed in with some truth, pretty much like the whole history of sky tides. All right. So we've got a price decline from, you know, the very, from about four days before. Uh, this is all an abnormal returns. We're down to, you know, we're falling before the article comes out. Um, from the, you know, the, the day of the article, we see probably the largest decline in slope uh, for both groups. And our pseudonymous ones reverse Again, not fully on average, right? Why not fully on average? Because remember in the Sky Tides example, we're mixing together here great pseudonymous attacks with manipulative ones, right? So we've got a pooling equilibrium and we've got a pooling average, right? So that's what's happening here. Um, as my colleague Merritt Fox writes in uh, his overview of stock market manipulation, the core harm of a manipulation will depend on the speed and nature of a price correction like this. That does not mean that every price reversal is manipulated, right? But uh, it should be the case that price reversals are a necessary condition for market manipulation. I mean, at least I would think so. Uh, the problem, as I said before, with the small caps is, you know, is five trading days enough time, at least for these folks, it seems to be. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on all the technical tables in the paper. I'll say that the options analysis is a diff and diff and diff. Uh, looking at adjusting for uh, uh, overtime trends in options, open interest in volume, put call parity. 
uh, we've got uh, the, the three levels of the difference in difference are uh, time, right, before and after the posting. We've got uh, anonymous versus non-anonymous, and we've got put in calls in here, right? So we're adjusting for uh, you know, time varying volatility uh, that, that's going to be driving options demand, general options demand, and uh, so forth and so on. Um, as I said, consistent with the informed trading literature in finance, we see this result across a number of outcomes, open interest in options, trading volume, and put call parity, which Martin Kremers has a great paper on showing that that's a huge predictor of informed trading. So pretty much what you would expect based on the literature. Um, we all, I also find that bid ask spreads widen in anticipation of the price reversal. So right after the article comes out, market makers seem to be on average expecting a reversal, and that is itself a kind of informed trading. So we see a widening of spreads. If you count up like the V, right, and you just aggregate all of the Vs, and you say if I replaced the you know, incorrect prices down the V with the end of the V, right, and I just kind of like make, fill in the V, how much aggregate mispricing do you get in this data? 20.1 billion. Right? Not like trillions, not like millions. It's happening. This is not, this is over seven years, so I don't want to overstate the effect that Seeking Alpha is, happening, is having on the markets. This is not like the end of the world, right? But it's, it's, it's definitely happening. Um, I do want to talk for a second about the reputation findings because I think this is important. Um, what we see in the data, here we go. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a model by Benabou and LaRoque which basically says that markets will stop listening to authors who manipulate. Um, what happens when manipulative authors switch identities? Well, as I said, pseudonymity undermines these reputational sanctions, and that gives us a few testable implications. What are they? Whoa. There we go. All right. Uh, pseudonymous authors should be engaging in informed trading when they are viewed as trustworthy by the market. What does it mean to be trustworthy? Well, there's sort of two conditions, right? One is that you've never posted before, and so in a pooling sense, you are viewed as having a positive probability of saying the truth. It, not 100%, but there's some likelihood you're going to be telling the truth. We know that's the case because we've got folks like Sky Tides out there building up their reputation by telling the truth the first time. The other case is that you have a history of being right. Um, what happens is that, uh, well, I'll just say with this bullet point here, which is that there is, in fact, in the data, uh, a substantial reversal with first-time authors only 35% of the time. So this assumption is empirically true. We should see, moreover, that pseudonymous authors disappear after the market realizes that they've been misled so that they can switch to a new identity. And kind of the final test that I do in the paper is to use linguistic stylometry, which is like an authorship attribution technique using machine learning, to track the identities as they evolve. Basically, the hypothesis test here is that the pseudonymous newly born authors should be more like the dead pseudonymous authors where dead means the ones who have stopped posting, on average. In any given case, you're going to have a lot of noise. But on average, you know, Darth Maul should be like Darth Vader a lot more than Josh Mitz is like Harry Mameski. Like, we should be different, but Darth should be a little bit more Darthy, right? And that's, that's the idea, right, on average. Um, and so that's, that's basically what I find. So negative reversals and options trading occur when authors are perceived as trustworthy. Pseudonymous authors disappear after manipulating the market. Um, the uh, market response to an article decreases as the author uh, accumulates basically a history of reversals. Um, uh, happy to go through this more in the q and I'll just say on stylometry, uh, this is a technique that's been used uh, for the Federalist Papers, the Book of Mormon. Um, there's a bunch of features in here which are standard in the literature for authorship detection. And uh, as I said, uh, what I basically do, try to get the math uh, on and off as fast as possible, basically I'm going <laughs> I'm to look at uh, the similarity of, uh, of an author and more and, uh, uh, to dead authors and ask whether that differs for pseudonymous or uh, non-pseudonymous authors. Pseudonymous authors are unconditionally more similar to former authors, but as they write more, they become more similar to authors who had published their final 
article. And that is consistent with the model's prediction and suggests a kind of substitute reputation that uh, is happening. I, I want to wrap up by talking a little bit here about, well, not so much about the law. Uh, I'll say very quickly, so this is in the law class, that it's really hard to figure out if any of this is illegal. Um, is it market manipulation? Well, probably in the strict legal sense, we haven't given enough facts to knock out sky tides under Section 90 or Rule 10b-5. Um, we talked about protected opinion. There's one idea that a colleague and myself have been tossing around, which is that switching directions of your trading, which is something that I measure, suggests a lack of genuine intent. And for the legal eagles in the room, that may be worth uh, thinking about. On September 13th, the SEC uh, actually brought a short and distort case. Their first one where they used the phrase in the title. And since the paper was online in June, I'm thinking they should have given me a citation, but they didn't. Uh, I was actually not the first to invent the title. It's like from 2002. But the SEC used the title and they brought this short and distort case in September. Uh, September 13th, the claim was that a hedge fund sought to manipulate the price of a pharmaceutical company by orchestrating a public campaign intended to shake investor confidence. That case just survived a motion to dismiss, so uh, it's moving forward, uh, and that'll be interesting. Let me just wrap up by talking a little bit here more broadly, since we have media in the room. Uh, you know, just like fake news, short and distort runs up against the First Amendment. Um, Short and distort is not fake news, to make this clear. This is opinion, but it poses many of the same challenges in that it's moving prices, sometimes in this V shape. Trading behavior, though, is not expression. And my suggestion, from a policy standpoint, is that we stop suing short sellers under defamation. They love that part. But that we look much more carefully at the trading behavior, because the trading behavior is not protected by the First Amendment. And you know, you can kind of link this back to the broader like ethical question around journalism, which is like maybe if you have a negative view about a company, just say what you think. You know, it's fine if you opened up a short position before that, although some people qu question, you know, that, but let's let's go with it. You got to get compensated for your research. Why should you be trading in options a day before your article hits seeking alpha? That just seems to me unnecessary to pay for great short seller research. Moreover, why should you be switching to calls, like expecting a V the day your article comes out? That's like the most damning evidence of all, right? Short seller says, X company is worthless, but when my article is posted, I'm going to buy a bunch of call options. <laughs> like, you can't get more manipulative than that in my mind, right? But it happens. It happens over and over and over again. And I don't think that's protected by the First Amendment. I don't think there's, uh, anyway, that is not even, that's not even close. Um, one question you might ask is, what's the social harm to transitory price manipulation? That's the bigger economics question. Um, well, it may not be transitory in the case of small firms. Uh, investors learn from prices. So in low information environments, we can get stuck in cascades here where, you know, I don't know what this company's worth, but by golly, if it fell 20%, I don't want to own it. Happens a lot with retail investors and with smaller caps. Uh, last thought is that post IPOs, we allow underwriters to stabilize prices. Maybe we need more safe harbors. Get out there and stabilize prices. Perhaps we need anti manipulation trading, right? That is to say, if you come in and you see this price decline and you want to buy, uh, the sole purpose of your buying is to counteract market manipulation, you may be yourself guilty of market manipulation. It's kind of a strange way the law works. Uh, so maybe we need some safe harbors, much like underwriters are able to do post IPOs in similar low information environments. So modest proposals. Um, in the paper, I talk a little bit about possible liability for seeking alpha. Uh, they're you know, kind of profiting from all this. We could talk about that. Uh, anyway, I think that's enough, and I'd love to uh, hear your questions. Do you have, oh, you guys have Hello. Uh, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, I'm a CEO in a small cap uh, oh. micro comp uh, company. We got attacked by short sellers. Terrific. Uh, You're buying my data set. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Uh, on seeking out a few times. Yeah. Uh, the first time we lost like 30% of the value. Here we go. It wasn't great. Yeah. Um, we tried going to seeking alpha. They wouldn't do anything. Yeah. They just told the uh, the 
blogger to change the words and right. the verbs that he uses and so forth. Right. Um, but it does hurt. And for a small cap, the, the major pain is that the stock goes down. Uh, for six months, you maybe can't raise funding. And you need the funding to grow. So it doesn't really V back yes. like you would like. So um, that was very interesting. I wanted to note that. But also ask, are other companies doing something in this space, like going after maybe criminal? Because uh, of trading manipulation, because if they you pursue them, you won't succeed, as, yeah. as you suggested. So what, what are companies A lot doing? of small cap CEOs tell me they want to put short sellers in jail. So they definitely want to. Um, <laughs> uh, so let me say, I think, so first of all, I think um, we want to be careful that, you know, and I'm, I'm going to say this in response to you, that I think short sellers do provide a really important service to the market. And that's been well established in the literature that constraints on short selling are bad. They are bad in many ways. They're bad for liquidity. They're bad for price discovery. Um, there's a difference between short selling and doing this. All right. And um, I think when it comes to small caps, I don't know your case, but I think it's definitely true that the greatest harm from manipulation is de a depressed price for six months. Your point about raising capital is, to me, the biggest welfare implication of this. It's more than bid-ask spreads and liquidity. It's that companies are in systematically depressed prices for long periods of time. There's a second part of this that I didn't talk about in the presentation, which is how shareholder litigation against the issuer is increasingly relying on short reports. So when you see a short report followed by a 30% price decline, what do you see the next day? A complaint, class action complaint filed by one of the entrepreneurial firms here in New York who love to file class action complaints right after short attacks are posted. We had that as well. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so, you know. We, we won that on motion to dismiss after Great. four years, but four years. Great. Uh, so, four <laughs> years you fight a motion to dismiss from a short report, all right? Now, that is socially wasteful. I'm sorry. It's socially wasteful for many reasons. First of all, the shareholder litigation is itself a complete. It's, it's totally circular. For those who don't know the literature, literally shareholders pay themselves and the lawyers collect rents along the way. The, if, you know, the deterrent effect uh, here seems to me, unlike typical corporate fraud cases, to be minuscule. It's almost impossible to justify in my mind. Um, let me say, though, moreover, uh, and this is where I am involved in ongoing litigation, so prefaced with that. I think in many of these cases, it can be shown that the 30% price decline was induced by the short seller's manipulative trading. That should undercut what's called loss causation, or the fundamental requirement under our securities fraud laws that the decline in price be attributable to the fraud. If the short seller is crashing the price, there should be no recovery to, to, to long shareholders from the issuer. The plaintiff should be suing the short sellers who crashed the price, not the issuers who issued the stock. That is the fundamental paradigm shift. I found that many plaintiff's firms are not excited about that, in part because they have a business model that relies on the short seller reports. And again, I am conflicted here, so just going to put that out there and make sure you understand that. I, I, I am very much involved in these cases, but I'm of the view that short sellers are uh, are subsidizing this kind of litigation. And moreover, they don't have deep pockets, and it's not as cool of a story as suing the issuer. So there's many components of what this is doing to small caps that aren't measured in this paper, but that are very much related to the behavior that I've documented here. Thank you. You're, yeah, whatever you like. Yeah. Um, this is not in my area, but I'm curious if you have a study on pump and dump. It seems to be a yeah. key to this. Yeah, so the flip side of this is definitely pump and dumps. Um, a lot of people have said to me, hey, you're too tough on short sellers. The real fraud are the puff pieces on seeking alpha. All right, that's fair, fair game. Um, we sh I am not looking at, at, puff pe at the long pieces on seeking alpha in this project. I'd like to. I think that um, it's a lot harder to move the price up for any kind of like reasonably sized, like let's say mid cap or above for sure, even a lot of small caps, it's hard to do this. Now in the over the counter market, we see puff pieces all the time in stock promotion schemes and that's been heavily researched already. Um, why is it hard to move a mid cap with a positive piece? Well, the assumption is if there's good news, the company's gonna rush to get it out there, right? Whereas they're likely to hide the bad news. And so the probability that the short seller has uncovered fraud is real. The probability that some analyst knows that Tesla is actually gonna take over the car market and like you just don't know that, so you better buy Tesla, mm, not as likely to believe. 
right? Whereas Insulet, God knows what's going on with that company. So that's why there's more price response. Yes, sir. Could you comment on electronic trading from two perspectives? One, yes. simpler uh, algorithms that only look at patterns of price changes, and then secondly, more complex algorithms that are themselves digesting news yes. and then uh, instituting trades, because unless the latter themselves have complex methods to identify reputation, the reputation issue won't even matter. Yes, great. So we see in the data, and this is again in my ongoing uh, litigation work, we, I, what I've been seeing in, in recent cases is that the articles are often accompanied by a flash uh, uh, crash. That is to say within seconds of a Seeking Alpha article being posted or hitting the news wires, there's a crash of 10% often in the stock. When you look at the limit order book, and I've now assembled the limit order book at Columbia in part because I want to research this more deeply, uh, you see that those flash crashes are often driven by very little trading and a lot of spoofing and layering for the market manipulation folks in the room. That basically means by a, a placing and canceling large amounts of orders, which have the mechanical effect of simulating excessive supply for the security which crashes the price. Now that was the basis of the Soreo indictment. For Navinder Soreo was indicted a couple years ago for flash crashing, as we all know, the Dow Jones, the entire market, by spoofing and layering S&P E-minis. My ongoing work suggests that this is happening with individual stocks. And in fact, others have academically have begun to write about these mini flash crashes. And the mini flash crash is the way that the, the HFTs and the algos are getting the first bite at this, right? And then you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of information do they condition on? Turns out, Seeking Alpha operates a web, a feed, a direct algorithmic feed. All you have to do is sign up. And I think, although I'm not sure, that maybe they make some money from that. And that that may be a part of the story that's getting underappreciated when we think of Seeking Alpha as this just freedom of speech playground where we all just come and express our views and we fight and we argue and disagree. Well, the HFTs make a lot of money moving prices in response to essay articles. Absolutely. Um, the example you gave uh, where they, they showed on their website, I think you said, that they, they were four out of four on yeah. recommendations prior to that. So Did you confirm that, yeah. that that actually existed, or was it just on their website? No, so they could be completely lying. Um, I did not independently check this. The numbers are pretty precise, although with the ICOs, everyone knows there's this new paper uh, out of Penn which shows that uh, you know, like all the ICOs are pretty much fraud, not all of them, but you know, 70% of ICOs don't deliver what they say they deliver. And there was this article about how they were photoshopping faces. So, you know, you never know, right? It's possible. In the investment world, anything can happen. Um, it's possible that he just made this number up. Um, yeah, in the Sky Tides case, he didn't. So, uh, in the Insula case, he didn't. So, you know, yeah, I don't know. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. So we don't fully know, right? We don't fully know. We know that you can pay for a subscription. Um, so far, they haven't cut me off, but uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, you know. You should check later today. Yeah, I should check later today. This is being broadcast. Um, no, I actually wanted to post my article on Seeking Alpha, and they said no. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, so one thing you can do is sign up for the monthly subscription that's $30 a month. I don't think they're making their money off of a $30 a month individual subscription. Um, the question is, going back to the HFT point, what, what does it cost to get a low latency feed from Seeking Alpha? That's the question, right? I don't know. But if it's anything like the stock exchanges, if they're anything like the NYSC, they are not selling that for cheap on the cheap, right? They are aware that there's a lot of value in being first to the party. And I don't know how much co-location goes for today, what, 150 grand a month or some crazy number like that? So anyway, you know, if you, if you analogize to what's happening with the exchanges, wouldn't be surprised if there's something similar. Yes, sir. Um, we've talked a lot about how Seeking Alpha can have a negative influence. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you think the broader policy should be about sites like Seeking Alpha, given that there might be positive. Yeah, there's a lot of positive. 
you know, just because there's some fraud in a market doesn't mean we should shut the market down, right? I mean, we've got fraud in the capital markets with public companies. You know, good number of, of companies out there are, are you know, frauds. Um, but it doesn't mean we shut down the capital markets, right? We, we understand that there will be some bad investments out there. There will be a lot of good investments, and we got to do everything we can to deter fraud and to punish it and to, and to remove it from our markets. So I would just take the same approach with SA, with Seeking Alpha, which is to say, you know, if you've got a repeat offender, someone who's done the V over and over again, it's probably time to kick them off the platform, right? I would like to see them cooperating with securities-based trading litigation. Right? I agree with the First Amendment protection for defamation. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm very much concerned about the potential to chill speech if we allow litigation and uncovering and unmasking pseudonymous identities purely on the basis of what they say. Because you know that an army of corporate lawyers will run out to do that as soon as there's a negative piece posted about the company, every time. But that is different than saying, Trading data in the options derivatives market, or spoofing, or layering, these should be fair game for litigation. And I would expect Seeking Alpha to cooperate. Unfortunately, so far, they haven't. And that's why I'm kind of, I want to hold them accountable. They should be, in my mind, subject to the same kind of regulation that the exchanges are and other key market participants, because they are a conduit for market moving information. And they should be accountable to, to regulators for that. And they should be complying with some best practices. So that's the paper gives some proposals in that direction. Yes, I guess we have time for one more. Yeah, one more. Hi, I wondered if you were aware of the consolidated audit trail and some of the challenges that they've been having in determining some of that flash crash, whether it's a major or a mini, if you had followed yeah. that as well. Yeah, so uh, as someone who's been trying to build the complete consolidated limit order book here for research purposes, I found it incredibly difficult, and I understand why uh, the SEC has had a hard time uh, with, with the CAT project. Um, for those who may not know, there was in the news, the big contractor thesis, it just, they just canceled the contract on them after trying to get the MIDAS system up and running. It's been a real mess. Um, you know, I've been assembling the data from the exchanges, and it's not cheap, even at the academic price. And uh, it's all in different formats, and it has to be normalized. You have to account for things like the times. You know, is a nanosecond there the same as a nanosecond there? And like, turns out it's not, because light has to travel. It's all these sort of weird things you have to think about, right? Um, and so you know, it turns out that it's really difficult, I think, for a regulator, which unfortunately is cash-strapped and constrained. Um, but I think it's essential. And you know, uh, one of my former colleagues at Columbia, Rob Jackson, is an SEC commissioner. Uh, now, and one of the things I said to him is, you guys should really be investing in high quality market surveillance. FINRA, I think, has been taking steps in this direction, but it should be happening all across the board. And I think that the broadest level, you know, what this project tells us and, and other work in this area, is that regulators have a long way to go because they should be cracking down on this. You know, they should be the ones policing the markets. Absolutely. You good? 